Good evening and welcome to tonight's Four Score Speaker Series. This evening, we are excited to welcome author Nancy Horan for a lively discussion on her most recent book, The House of Lincoln. My name is Phyllis Evans and I'm the Senior Director of Development at the Lincoln Presidential Foundation. Our foundation is thrilled to be leading and supporting efforts to create high quality award-winning educational programs, exhibits, and resources that empower individuals to learn about Lincoln's life, leadership, and legacy. For more information on how you can support this mission, please visit our website at lincolnpresidential.org. Before we begin tonight's program, I'd like to remind you that we will entertain questions from the audience, so please type them in the Q&A box below and we'll get to as many as possible. And now please join me in welcoming our Foundation President and CEO, Aaron carlson Max. Aaron, Thank you, Phyllis. Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another Four Score Speaker Series program. We're delighted to be joined by author Nancy Horan to discuss her third novel, The House of Lincoln, which chronicles the intersecting lives of three families in Springfield, Illinois, beginning in the 1850s. A Portuguese house girl for the Lincoln family narrates the struggle of her immigrant family and her experiences inside the home of her employer. A minister and a barber to Lincoln reveals the Underground Railroad activities of his free Black family, and Mary Todd Lincoln's point of view reveals her joys and profound losses over the course of her life. Culminating in the 1908 Springfield race riot, the House of Lincoln documents the Civil War and its aftermath in Abraham Lincoln's chosen hometown and portrays a story beneath the more familiar history of Abraham Lincoln. We hosted Nancy for a talk to a packed audience at Lincoln Home National Historic Site in Springfield in August. Tonight's program is a completely different format. So while we are hosting this webinar to ensure people across the country could be part of this conversation, if any of you in the audience also attended in person, you're bound to learn something new tonight. Nancy is the author of two other novels, including New York Times bestselling book, Loving Frank, published in 2007, which chronicles a little known chapter in the life of legendary American architect, Frank Lloyd Wright, and his client, Mama Borthwork Cheney. Loving Frank remained on the New York Times bestseller list for over a year. It has been translated into 60 languages and received the 2009 prize for historical fiction awarded by the Society of American Historians. Her second novel, Under the Wide and Starry Sky, published in 2014, explores the unlikely relationship of Robert Louis Stevenson and his spirited American wife, Fanny Vandegrift Stevenson. Stevenson has been credited with a wise observation, quote, everybody, soon or late, sits down to a banquet of consequences, end quote. And this and her other books, Nancy is interested in how her characters arrive at the banquet and how they deal with the results of their choices. A native Midwesterner, Nancy Horan was born and raised in Springfield and was a Chicago journalist before turning to fiction writing. She now lives with her husband on an island in Puget Sound. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to author Nancy Horan. Nancy, it's a pleasure to have you join us tonight. Just delighted to be here. Hi. Well, our audience is often interested in an author's professional journey, and you made what feels like a big change from a career in journalism um, to a career as a best-selling author of historical fiction. So both writing, but different processes that go into them. Would you please share with us what inspired that career change? Well, there were many career changes, actually. I was... Uh... I went to the University of Illinois in, in Champaign and got a degree in English. And I taught English in California and also uh, in the Chicago area. Um, and, you know, I had um, probably about six or seven years of teaching. And then I went into some corporate work. I tried different things. Um, ultimately, I started uh, writing for the Chicago Tribune uh, and some magazines and really enjoyed that work. And I took a course at University of Chicago uh, on fiction writing. And it was just exploratory. But um, as I was leaving the class, uh, the, the instructor said to me, you could write a novel, you just haven't found your material yet. And I thought, gosh, I mean, we were just pouring out our lives and our concerns in that class. And I thought, isn't that my material? And within weeks, I came upon a little article about Frank Lloyd Wright and an unknown chapter in his life, or little known. It had been quietly swept under the rug. 
So I I didn't even know I was writing historical fiction. I was right. I was just possessed by this story. I felt the need to tell, and over time, of course, I did realize that it I was doing deep historical research, and that has been my pattern through all three books I've written is is to go to the real history. I love. I I, I don't feel inclined to invent preposterous uh, plots. Uh, the history coughs up some of the most interesting um, storylines that I could ever imagine. So uh, that was the case with Frank Lloyd Wright's story. I loved learning about Robert Louis Stevenson and his pistol packing wife. And uh, then I, I did turn to um, my interest turned to Lincoln. So, so my, my, Evolution as a, a historical fiction writer um, was was slow to come to me, but I love it so much now. I understand that research is a big part of my love for the process. So uh, this particular book, um, uh, I it, it the inspiration for the book really was um, a number of things. I was looking, it was 2014 when I finished uh, Under the Widened Starry Sky, and I was kind of thinking about Lincoln uh, and and thinking about what I had learned about him. Um, but in any case, um, there was a lot going on in 2014. We were a year into Black Lives Matter. Uh, uh, commentators on TV were continually saying that we were a polarized nation, uh, and that, uh, and then you know, in, people who were interviewed said we're approaching a civil war potentially. That I found to be deeply disturbing. I felt it was loose talk. I felt like um, I wanted to explore time period. Uh, when democracy and uh, unity in the United States was at its breaking point, and that was when the Civil War, the buildup to the Civil War. And so I started reading about Lincoln, especially in the 1850s. And I realized that um, unlike other books about Lincoln, I really wanted this to be about the world he came from, the world of Springfield, the people who nurtured this man I mean, when he left, he spoke so eloquently about how he loved uh, the people of Springfield. And so I I wanted to uh, explore who they were somehow and what the world was that brought us Abraham Lincoln and, and helped nurture him from a guy whose socks didn't match when he was walking down the street. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he was sort of uh, unkempt, much to Mary's chagrin. And... Um, and then, you know, to eventually see him depart Springfield as the new president of the United States in 1860. So I, I wanted to look at that buildup. I wanted to look at those years of, of um, unfettered time when he wasn't doing that concern about uh, the presidency. And then I follow them through the presidency from Springfield to Washington and thereafter, all the way to the 1908 race riot. So that's that's essentially how I became interested in it. And, and certainly as I pursued it, I discovered that a lot of people don't know anything about the Civil War. And I just happened upon uh, a video of a young college student who was part of her current events club. And she was going around interviewing fellow students and asking them who won the Civil War. And they could not oh. say who won or what it was. They asked, was that 1965 or uh, did the Confederates win? I, that was the closest anybody could remember uh, uh, of the people that she interviewed. And just to stand by the work she had done, she went and repeated the same experiment at an East Coast college and got a similar kind of broad-based ignorance. And I thought this was the most significant challenge to democracy in the United States. Everybody should know this. And so 
it was my own feeling of spreading some information about it that also motivated me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and, um, and you mentioning his farewell address, even it, it reminded me that you opened the book with uh, a quote and excerpt from that address too. I was delighted, Nancy, to see so many people that you include in this book that are familiar, the Lincoln family for sure, um, but also other names that stand out and that might be familiar to people who, who know some of this history, like William Donegan, like Jameson Jenkins, like Mariah Vance, like Charlotte Rodriguez de Souza. Um, and we actually have included all four of those individuals in an exhibit that will be opening soon at Lincoln Hill. Right. So reading your book, I thought, oh my goodness, that's it's it's almost like we were, you know, researching the same lives while you were. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So that was exciting for me. But I feel like you did a very credible job in this book of conveying how vibrant and multicultural Springfield was. Um, in the 1850s period, there were people who came to Springfield in search of a better life, even if they weren't entirely free or welcome there. Um, I wondered if we could talk a little bit about the main character, though. Anna um, Ferreira, I think is how it would be pronounced in Portuguese. Uh, or perhaps you know perhaps better than I do how to say it, but uh, I call her Anna Ferreira. Ferreira, okay. And you you could have chosen any number of lenses through which to tell this story. And you chose that of a Portuguese child refugee. And then of course we follow her as she ages throughout the book, who had fled Madeira with her family, wound up in sugarcane plantations in Trinidad and then to the United States and eventually Springfield. Can you tell us about that choice to have yeah. her be <laughs> the, the main character and then the lens through which we hear about what's happening in many of the chapters? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I needed, first of all, a character who could live through that stretch of time because the book goes from 1851 to 1909, to the point uh, a year after the race riot. And um, I happened upon a bit of historical information about this group of Portuguese refugees who uh, were exiled uh, from Madeira and who came via Trinidad to Springfield. They were on their way hoping to work in a hemp company between Jacksonville and Springfield. And uh, they got to America. The uh, job offer was rescinded for some 300 or more people. And so those refugees sort of divided up between Springfield and Jacksonville. And um, I knew that the Lincolns had employed uh, Portuguese workers in their home. And I thought, okay, I, I, I learned quite a bit about this group of Portuguese people. And there were old books about Springfield residents, prominent residents of Springfield, some of whom were Portuguese. And I thought I need a, a Portuguese girl who, who is challenged with, um, adapting to a new environment, having lived by water, surrounded by water, and, and coming to a landlocked place of Springfield, Illinois. Being a kid of nine, nine years of age, you know, uh, a, a shy girl, a bright girl, but having to master English. Um, and when we meet her, when she's 11, uh, desperately longing, she's she's longing for a friend. That's what eleven year olds want. Girls, anyway, want most in the world. I think is a close friend. Um, but in the case of all of these people, whether whether it's Spencer Donegan, um, a free black man who's come to Springfield with his fu a fully extended family to live and work there, they have their own issues. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I like to look in all my work at the forces bearing down on people, the forces that we all experience that you hadn't counted on. Uh, and I think in the case of the Portuguese family, the Ferreras, they come to America hoping for religious freedom. Mm -hmm. They uh, they are Presbyterians, converts, and, and they had uh, trouble staying in Madeira. And so they they know what they want. They imagine this place where that freedom exists, 
but making money, putting bread on the table, and then finding yourself with a war approaching. And ultimately, you know, many immigrant families, first generation uh, children, ultimately serve in wars, die for the cause of democracy. That was very alive for them. That democracy meant so much to every one of these characters. So um, that's how I ultimately chose this, this girl who is innocent, naive, who, who in, I think, by chapter two, witnesses uh, a slave hunter uh, coming into the shop of William Donegan. And uh, suddenly she's thrown into this bigger issue of um, a force bearing down on the black community. And she, her friend, her best friend is, is a black girl living in Springfield as a free black person. Yeah, and I, I loved the relationship and the tension over time between Anna and Cal, her friend in the book. And um, something you just touched on is, is something I wanted to talk about with you, which is that there are a number of themes that I was identifying or picking up on uh, throughout the book or that came across to me. And one is this idea of uh, crossroads and how Springfield was a crossroads. For example, an intersection between those headed east to west. You even included a reference to how the, the Donner Party had passed through Springfield on their way to California, but also those traveling south to north along the Underground Railroad yes. um, into their freedom. Um, but it was also an intersection of cultures, old country, new country, um, different states coming together here. And then it also includes this intersection of life and death, the transition from youth to adulthood, president-elect to president, a world with Lincoln and a world after Lincoln. And um, I feel like having said that in this theme of intersections, you also did a beautiful job of conveying what I think is an important truth, which is that while there are many intersections, none of this is strictly linear and that time feels like it's folding back on itself from time to time with progress and then a regression. Can you talk a little bit about how you managed to weave this narrative while showing that there is this reality of that sometimes it's one step forward, two steps back, two steps forward, one step back, that different characters are dealing with at different times of their life? Interesting. Well, I think that happens in the lives of each of these characters. So the narrators, uh, include that there are three narrators or, or whose minds we enter. Um, and the primary narrator is Anna Ferreira. But William Donag or, um Spencer Donegan, who, the brother of William Donegan, who Spencer was uh, an occasional, uh, Lincoln was an occasional uh, customer mm -hmm. of Spencer who shared a barber shop with Lincoln's very close friend and uh, primary barber, who was um, William de Fleurville, uh, a Haitian immigrant who had known Lincoln for some time since they were young men and, and had a close friendship with him. And then, um, you know, so we have Mary as well, three characters. And you know, throughout Mary's life, it, it was two steps forward, one step back. Uh, certainly uh, with uh, the Donegan family and with with uh, Spencer, you know, making it to Illinois, going through all the hoops they had to go through uh, in order to become citizens in the state. And um, contrary to my glowing education uh, and, and idea that we were on the right side of the Civil War, aren't we lucky? Free state. It turned out we, Illinois was a free state, entered the Union as a free state, but within three months, the legislator cooked up some um, black laws that strictly uh, prohibited much uh, movement or, or exploration by um, 
African American free blacks, it was specifically designed to control the lives of free blacks and to keep free blacks from coming into the state. So, you know, for Spencer, it was two steps forward, one step back. He was active, he was a minister of the AME church. He established the first AME church in uh, Springfield. He was a barber, he supported a big family, and he was a regular uh, person who he attended the first colored convention movement as it was called then probably met Frederick Douglass at that first um, event. And um, so there were hopeful moments for him. And then, the, you know, there were black laws and there were there was the Fugitive Slave Act and all these things that worked against his people. So that's Mary, that's, and I'm sure that Anna and her people um, also were frustrated as well in terms of, um, you know, finding that there were other issues in this country besides just survival, you know, and putting food on the table. There was a an approaching war. So, yeah, I think there is that uh, folding back. I understand what you're saying. And it's very perceptive that it's a cross crossroads, too. Really, Springfield is a fourth character. Yes, absolutely. That comes across absolutely. in the book so well. Yeah, yeah. it's a fourth character. It's full of all, the, it's a microcosm of the whole United States. You know, you've got, you've got Eastern uh, abolitionists who came. You've got really um, pro-slavery copperheads who were uh, active during the Civil War. There were people who were um, pre-KKK people, uh, the Knights of the Golden Circle, who were attacking uh, Black families in Illinois at that time. And the Donegan, uh, one of the Donegans was a victim of them. So it wasn't, it, the deep racism was the thing that frankly just stunned me. Uh, that That was nothing I had learned about, certainly not the 1908 race riot in Springfield, certainly not the black laws. Mm -hmm. I didn't learn anything about the, I don't remember anything about the Fugitive Slave Act, though as an adult, I had read some about it, but, but to understand the depth of the racism that had existed, not only in Illinois, but all across what is now called the Midwest, um, and certainly in the East Coast as well, uh, it was, it, it helped me understand what Abraham Lincoln was up against. Yes. Because I think Lincoln, uh, I think Lincoln always hated racism. Uh, he hated slavery, but he was also, he had his own prejudices. And you'll see over the book, I tried to follow faithfully his evolution in thinking. And certainly he was helped along by people like Frederick Douglass and no doubt certainly other people, abolitionists, and certainly probably people he knew in Springfield, you know? So, yeah. Well, and um, I appreciated how you had people like Spencer Donegan, for example, and his brother and others um, talk through, for example, or, or Owen and Anna talk about the Lincoln Douglas debates and what Lincoln, and they were working it out in dialogue in a way that invited the reader into thinking through those issues as well. And why was Lincoln saying what he was saying and what was the audience like and what, you know, what did he really mean? And then what did his actions show? I thought you did um, that in a way that was very satisfying as a reader and well, with the history too. Well, that's what fiction can do for us. <laughs> I mean, fiction, uh, you know, some people are probably uh, wary of historical fiction. I can understand it. But in in my case, I love the real history. And if I've, if I've got enough information, as, as there was plenty on Mary and Abraham Lincoln, but when it came to Spencer Donegan, it was, it was a real hunt. Um, you know, I found some things, but, you know, part of the joy of doing research like this is finding something that I think nobody else put together or something yeah. like that. And what I, what I could do with fiction is something that 
probably a historian, a nonfiction writer wouldn't do. For example, I found something in the newspaper that said, I, you know, you put in the word Donegan and you search Illinois newspapers and you try to figure it out. But I have the quote here. It, it's uh, a little, a little paragraph that appeared in the uh, register and it said, is it so? Are we correctly informed when we learn that Frederick Douglass was invited to dinner with Donegan the barber yesterday and was assured that other distinguished gentlemen of the Negro party were to be present? Did they did the said dining come off? And if so, what a feast there must have been. Well, I didn't see any follow-up on that. Mm -hmm. I did not find any confirmation, but I didn't care. It was a great scene to be had. And I, I was going to write that scene. And it just allowed me to have Frederick Douglass tell the Donegan family about uh, what it was like to meet Abraham Lincoln in the White House and the struggles he had in his own family and to bring some humanity to Frederick Douglass. So those are the jewels that you find and you think, oh, I'm so happy for this. Yeah. Well, and as you say, historians and public historians, we're we're bound to explain what we know and what we don't know. Mm -hmm. And while we're required to interpret those facts and that detective work to draw conclusions, there are always pieces missing. Um, right. and what makes what can make that especially frustrating, I think, at times is that it it can also be very true when the stakes are high, when the historical record um, would have meant that people were jeopardizing their safety or their reputation or their livelihood or their lives to record what they knew or what they were doing. I mean, sometimes it just it didn't get recorded, but as an author of historical fiction, you get to play out those what ifs and fill in those blanks. And one mm -hmm. example of that in particular in the book is how you explore what the Lincolns knew and when they knew it with regard to Underground Railroad activities. And I love, there's there's a scene in the book where you have Jameson Jenkins and William Donegan and they're, they're riding in a cart and Mary Lincoln and Anna see this out the window and Anna comes to this realization that Mary Lincoln knows what's going on. And if she knows, then her husband, Abraham Lincoln knows. Can you explain that choice and why it was important to the narrative? Because that was exactly what you're talking about. You get to fill in some of these blanks. Yes, you do. And I have to just um, start by saying that there was a brilliant historian, uh, Richard Hart, who lived in Springfield and who wrote about Lincoln's neighborhood. He did a study, for those of you who don't know, he he looked at a three block radius around the Lincoln's home and he discovered that Lincoln's, by our contemporary standards, lived in a very diverse neighborhood, you know, where there were three uh, large extended black families. There were people from uh, Northern European countries of all sorts um, and uh, age ranges and incomes you know, from poor to wealthy, the Lincolns certainly started poor. And when they added a second uh, story to their home, suddenly they appeared more affluent and they probably were. Um, but um, yeah, that's so uh, that's that's the satisfying part of um, finding that kind of historical work that's been done. I think historical fiction writers stand on the shoulders of of uh, historians like Richard Hart and many others. So, um... well, and I'm glad you mentioned that. One of our questions that already came in was from Bob Willard who noted that Dick Hart was a good friend. And, oh. and he was wondering how much you relied on that on that book, um, which came out about Lincoln Springfield too. So it's it's good to know that that, um, that, that was something that you, that you referenced as part of your work. Yeah, very much. So, you're, you're going to have to take me back to your question. <laughs> you, your last question. Oh, oh, it was about, um, you know, when I guess you did answer it mostly. It's sort of about in, in, um, exploring that who know, who yes. knew what, when, yes. um, and you're able to do that through the historical, you know, as, as the author, but uh, it was sort of, can you explain the, the choice and why that was important to the narrative? Yes, exactly. And that um, that 
was influenced by Richard Hart's thinking because he thought surely the Lincolns knew uh, about the Underground Railroad activity of their neighbors and and um, their friends. So it, I liked that interpretation. Surely they had to know, and so it happened in the book. It's it's not officially known, I suppose, but um, it seemed likely. And that's something that I can do. I mean, if I've lined up a whole stack of information about something, I just had a, a scholar uh, approach me about um, uh, my Frank Lloyd Wright book and ask, well, um, did you specifically find out why Frank Lloyd Wright ordered yeah. three grand pianos? And no, I didn't find out, but I know he had he had them, and it was necessary to his work. So, you know, you make assumptions. You you can jump. To, uh, you can make assumptions if you have enough clues. I feel in yeah. in fiction. Well, and you just mentioned that you've had historians reach out to you and ask if if something in your book sort of how many receipts you have for it. One of the questions we have from a member of the audience is, do you have or have you had your books read prior to publication by a historian to do any kind of fact checking? And or is that something that is a typical step for writers of historical fiction at all? I'm not sure, uh, but I, it so happens that the um, publisher did have a reader who who uh, read the book uh, and introduced some ideas I might think about, you know, mm -hmm. some some history that I had not included. But, uh, you know, it's it's hair raising to write <laughs> this kind of fiction. You don't want to make a mistake because it it sort of um, diminishes everything you've accomplished if, if if you're loaded with mistakes. And I don't I want to get it right. And there's a reason I want to get it right, because these were real people. I'm writing about real people. I feel I owe it to them. They may have been gone for 150 years, but I want to get them right. Mm -hmm. Well, and you touch on so many different things throughout history that, as you mentioned, you you hadn't known before you do, dug into the research and doing this book, or, or maybe you learned about it within the past decade when you had the idea for the book. In doing your research, what revelations were most surprising to you? Um, I think certainly the most profound revelation was the depth of the racism in Illinois at that time. It was shocking. I mean, in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, you really see it uh, when, um, you know, Douglas was, was essentially talking in terms of white supremacy in a way that the vice president of the... Um, of the Confederacy was talking when he made a speech uh, called the Cornerstone speech. It was very similar. Douglas was saying the um, Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were written by white men for European white people. And specifically, he lists who is not included in that, not Native Americans, not Blacks, not, not Mexicans, not South Americans, not Central Americans, not Asians. Uh, and he used that speech repeatedly during the debates. And then I read, uh, you know, that cornerstone speech in which um, the vice president of the Confederacy crowed about how proud they were to be establishing a new constitution and a new a new government based upon the notion that whites are superior to blacks and that it had never been done in the history of the world up to that date. Imagine. Yeah. So when you, when you see that, you think, okay, we've come a long way. And yet it's so hurtful that you realize we have taken steps backward as well. You know, it's that two steps forward, one step back. That's so discouraging. So I think that was, I think the racism was simply in the air and, um, and it was instructive to me. Yeah. That, that explanation also calls to mind 
for me, the fact that throughout this book, you have some lines that are very memorable and you give some of your characters some very memorable quotes. And one that really left up the page for me came from Mrs. Alsop. So you portray her as an Anna's benefactor. She's an older, wealthy resident of Aristocracy Hill. She's childless. She's an abolitionist. She's a Presbyterian and very <laughs> devoted to education. That, that definitely plays into it there, her, her religion. And she, she pays for Anna's education and for her companionship. And there's a moment where Anna is struggling with the realization of how color affects rights and freedoms in this country and how it relates to slavery and her best friend, Cal, who's of mixed race and how she's treated differently. And Mrs. Alsop notes that historically the Portuguese were very involved in the slave trade. And this provokes a visceral reaction in Anna. And in response, you have Mrs. Alsop say, quote, we all trail ghosts. What matters is what we do now. And that to me feels like such a timeless quote. And I wanna know a little bit about what inspired you to write that those lines in particular it's it's what i believe and it's a belief i came to um just in writing the book and i've thought this way for a long time it's it's um i think it's really important however to acknowledge the history that's painful to look at for mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. uh, because we we won't get anywhere until we do until there's a reconciliation, until there's, um, you know, a realization of what has been done by our people. Uh, we're a new generation, uh, you know, nevertheless, you've, you've got to be able to acknowledge, and that's, that's the purpose of this book in a way, is, you know, if you, if you can learn about it, then you can understand better what people have gone through, why there is um, a Black Lives Matter movement that's so strong, because it's, you know, it's been repeated so many times, this great struggle. So in any case, that's, that's really what I was thinking with that quote. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that you show that through, throughout time, that, 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 that sentiment is is there. There are pro-slavery forces, copperheads that you mentioned, Knights of the Golden Circle. Um, and then you also bookend the story itself with the 1908 Springfield race riots. And that that calls to mind another one of the lines from your book that I wanted to ask you about. It's when you're sharing more about Spencer Donegan, William Donegan's brother. He's the founding pastor of Springfield AME Church. And throughout the book, as one of the narrators, as you mentioned, he really gives voice to the frustration with the contradiction between American ideals as espoused in the Declaration of Independence, acknowledging who it was written by and, and for whom, the, the words are expansive and aspirational. Um, but the, the contradiction between those ideals and the reality of what he's experiencing in Illinois in particular, but in the US in general. And you wrote, quote, he wondered how it was that the world was so big, yet the space for him in it was so small. Mm -hmm. And he hated the boundaries fear drew around him. And one of the things that struck me about that, it, that it wasn't just his fears and his worries, but that you were also communicating these prejudicial fears um, of others clearly around him. And that, mm -hmm. that felt like really a, a timeless point that you were making that mm -hmm. relates, as you're saying, to the Black Lives Matter movement and beyond and things that we're experiencing today. Can you mm -hmm. speak a little bit to that? Um, I thought a lot about Spencer and, um, you know, of course, he was a real person. Mm -hmm. I, can, uh, I can assume and I can tell because he established the AME Church in Springfield that he was a spiritual man, um, a good man. And actually, he stayed involved with um, the color convention movement really in, you know, in reaction to the Black Laws of Illinois. And he worked with John Jones, who was a very important leader of that movement in Chicago. And when they finally got rid of the Black Laws, after emancipation had been declared by Lincoln, those darn 
black laws stayed on in Illinois to the end of the war. And yeah. they got rid of them at the bitter end of the war. And Spender was part of that. So I think that um, he was a man who was incredibly strong. In fact, the whole that whole family is so impressive. You can't believe it. But um, that he he must have had moments of just despair. He was raising children. What what would his children experience? You know. So I tried to um, just imagine you know, moments of despair for him and moments of hope for him and um, and for all of them. So that, that scene came out of a, a quote I once heard um, someone say, a teacher of mine, who's, who said something about go pasture your soul. And that's the, la that's the word that, so I had his mother say to him, when he got in these moods, he would just go out and sleep out out in this, you know, at night and just get away from everything. And um, his mother said, go pasture your soul, but be home in time to feed the animals. You know, so she was, um, she was recognizing that spirituality of him and she was passing on her own spirituality. Yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of empathy and compassion for all the characters, whether they're um, people from real life, like Spencer Dunnigan and that large extended family um, or the fictional characters like Anna. I feel like each one of them demonstrates that and you also can evoke that in the reader with the way that you um, unfurl their stories throughout the book. Another one of the themes that felt like it kept reappearing throughout the book was this idea of divided houses, that House of America being divided, the House of Mary Lincoln, um, the Todd family being divided. And Anna's family being religiously divided when her mom yes. returns to her Catholic faith. faith. Um, and you talked about how the idea for this book came out of, you know, what was happening in 2014. And here we are today, you know, arguably things have gotten much worse, not better, yet we still have hope in the face of all of this. In, in thinking about this idea of divided houses, um, can you talk more about how that theme inspired um, the narratives that you shared throughout this book, because that definitely came through to me that you were talking about that on both a literal level within family structures, but then how that winds up being replicated here at a national scale. Mm -hmm. Interesting question. Um, I, I think about um, even the house divided between Mary and Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm. uh, not only between her siblings but uh, and that family, but between her husband and herself. Um, there, Mary, Mary has gotten pretty bad rap from um, his some historians, and Mary was not an easy woman. I think she did experience um, mental illness, periods of mental illness, but Mary... Uh, also had periods, long periods of sanity, where she was a huge support to her husband. She was a loving mother to her children. She was a good neighbor. She, uh, one neighbor uh, had a child and she was too ill to nurse the baby. And Mary nursed that baby. Uh, and when the baby died anyway, then Mary prepared food to send over to the baby. So Mary had many good qualities. Um, some uh, comments that have appeared in uh, books about Lincoln uh, speak of um, judges or fellow attorneys on the circuit with Lincoln who pitied Lincoln because he didn't want to go home to Mary. She was so difficult. There's another side to that, and that's that Mary was working as a single mother yeah. while he was away for weeks and months. And, and, I mean, I can just recognize how hard that was for her and how anger probably festered. And she said to one of her neighbors, I could love my husband better, you know, if if he were here more. So I think there was that going on. And I think there, there are, um, you know, domestic dramas in this book. And there's also, that's what I mean by um, 
the force is bearing down on people. Mm -hmm. We all we have all experienced those. You know what? How old you were would determine what you went through. I remember the Vietnam War. We've all gone through uh, COVID together. Mm -hmm. These other forces that impact us, and um, I think it's a lot of stresses. And I think it's very hard to keep a hopeful perspective. Somebody said to me as I left as I left that uh, talk we gave uh, at the visitor center in Springfield, he said, who is our Lincoln today? Mm. And I thought, oh my gosh, who is our Lincoln today? You know, who's going to, who's going to help us heal. And um, I just, I just feel that Lincoln rose to the occasion. You know, I mean, he was, he was a person who, people would not have nominated as the savior of the day probably mm -hmm. early on and and i'm hoping that we can reach that point that lincoln brought about and also all the people in the country brought about really uh uh in making that war end and um and there's a whole lot more to say about that war, but <laughs> there is a that. And I appreciate that you show how many people were involved in each of these big moments throughout um, the nation's historical events that you cover throughout this book. That, yes, there are lead actors, but there are many different people who are being acted upon by forces, as you've mentioned, but who are also galvanizing to create action and change throughout mm -hmm. this book yeah um, I'm gonna, oh go ahead i was just going to add that um you know lincoln is right is very much deserving of great recognition for everything he did there was another movement going on which was that um you know those soldiers appearing in southern states the union soldiers appearing was a sign that people could leave the plantations, the slaves could leave. Mm -hmm. And there was an enormous, enormous movement going on of, of um, migration. Mm -hmm. And these people went and followed the soldiers. And this is a piece of history I also didn't know. Um, and, yeah. and, and it really involved this massive relocation of people uh, to get behind union lines and work for mm -hmm. the U.S. Army, basically. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, we're going to turn to our audience questions now. And Ed Daring asks, what areas did you cover in your journalism career? Oh, um, I mostly, uh, for the Tribune, well, I did um, stories about architecture, design, that kind of thing. And that yeah. is ultimately how I got into um, Frank Lloyd Wright. And yeah. That's fantastic. Um, we also have another question. Is there any discussion going on about making a movie based on the novel? Not that I know of. <laughs> okay. Think you think that you have a, a, a group of us who would vote in favor of that for sure. <laughs> um, all right, let's see here. Uh, Paul Dinkle asks, do you think Lincoln might have felt he was living in a more modernized or enlightened culture from his predecessors? Um, than that today's contemporaries seem to believe they are? I didn't quite understand that. Yeah, hang on a second. Let me reread that. Do you think Lincoln might have felt he was living in a more modernized or enlightened culture from his predecessors, ancestors? Maybe it's then today or that today's contemporaries seem to believe they are. I'm not, I'm not clear on what that last part is, but I think the basic question there is, do you think Lincoln felt he was living in a more enlightened culture than his predecessors? Well, he personally was, uh, because he had educated himself. Um, in terms of enlightenment, um, you know, I, I'm sure that he read broadly and he and he learned about great historical ideas. Um, spiritually, it's interesting to track uh, his progress, his, uh, some people believe that he was an agnostic early in his life. Uh, uh, but when you read about what he said when he was in was he he was in the hell of overseeing 
a war that was just, you know, so brutal and so yeah. brutal, so savage. Um, I think he he definitely had some kind of spiritual awakening. So if that's what the the person means by enlightenment, I'm not sure, but um, there was that element happening for Lincoln. Yeah. Lincoln was in, Lincoln was absolutely in despair during uh, a lot of that time. Yeah, and Paul, if we if we didn't convey that question correctly, please please feel free to chime back in um, in the Q and A or chat, and we'll we'll clarify that question. Um, Melvin Cunningham would like to know how you would rate Abraham Lincoln as a writer. Oh, the best, <laughs> the absolute best. He said things so succinctly. Yeah. I mean, you know, the Gettysburg Address. I mean, so many things that he wrote were so beautifully written. And yet, if you read what he wrote for the Cooper Union speech, where he explained it, everything legally, it's like so long and detailed. Very dense. Yeah. And I, it's almost too much. So uh, I think when he, in emotional moments, he, he wrote brilliantly. I just think he was a brilliant writer. I love that you also um, used some of his fragments um, that he that he wrote down, where he was working through some of the logic in his mind of how to how to argue against slavery. That you use some of those um, things that weren't necessarily meant for public consumption; they weren't public speeches, but it's where he's working through that. I really appreciated that you used some of that in the book as well. Hmm. Um, another question from Wesley is: Did Abraham and Mary? through your research, did you find that they had any conversations about slavery um, and and the brutality in the Civil War that, that you found was documented? Did you run across any concrete evidence that the two of them had had those kinds of discussions? Um, I don't recall it right now. I do, I, I mean, mostly you just read about behaviors. Uh, Mary Mary had close friendships, uh, certainly in the White House, um, with African American women. Um, so, I think that um, it was really a behavior that revealed an attitude. Um, but no, I don't. I don't. I can't think of anything immediately. And Patricia uh, Dorr asks. How did Anna and her family choose Springfield, Illinois? Um, and I know that wasn't entirely a choice and she's a fictional character, but, but you're reflecting real events. So can you talk a little bit about how people from Madeira, Portugal wound up going to Trinidad and then I think it was supposed to be New York and then Springfield. Can you talk about what seems like a very convoluted- Yes. Um, day to well, up at Springfield? Uh, so- I got my histories through a few books that were written by um, people at that time. Mm -hmm. And then another book written by a descendant of, of one of the um, uh, Scottish, well, followers of the Scottish minister. There was, there was a Scottish minister and his wife on, on their way to China to do um, uh, proselytizing work. And uh, what happened is she became ill and stopped. They stopped in Madeira. And uh, it was there that they began uh, taking, he was a doctor, so he took care of people and um, she read the Bible, I, my impression is, in the waiting room to people. And and they made conversions and uh, to the Presbyterian faith. And it is a Catholic nation. And so what happened was um, ultimately there was real pressure from, uh, I think, from the Catholic hierarchy to... Uh, move these people away uh, or discourage them. And so uh, they hopped on a ship that was um, headed to um, Trinidad. Many people who were uh, of the Presby Presbyterian faith from Madeira spread to different islands. But these people came to, and then with the help of a minister, they wanted to get to the United States because they were not adapting at all to working in the fields, uh, sugarcane fields. And so they had this job offer from a hemp company in between Jacksonville and Springfield. And they um, happily 
accepted the offer and then it was it was rescinded. So that's how they ended up. And the people of Springfield opened their arms. I mean, they were really welcoming to these people. And I think Jacksonville as well. And more people uh, from that group of Madeiras came as well. So that was kind of how it happened, that there were hundreds of Portuguese people in 1849 in Springfield, Illinois. Fantastic. Um, can you tell us, Nancy, because you, you start the book in 1909 with the centennial celebrations for Lincoln, and then you also end the book with scenes from, uh, and and sort of two separate celebrations that are occurring, one at the church at St. Paul's and one at the Arsenal. Can you tell us about your artistic decision as an author to bookend this story about Lincoln with the centennial celebrations of his life? Well, we open the book with Anna. Uh, the first chapter, the first <clears throat> bookend is Anna at the age of 68. And um, she's. Re I reflected history in that moment. And that was the, um, the celebration of the 100 year uh, anniversary of Lincoln's birthday. There was a big celebration. There were no black guests. And it turned out, I read in research material, that uh, there were numerous Black citizens who had tried to go to that event, and they could pay the $25 ticket cost, but they didn't get in. The only Black people in that auditorium at that moment were waiters. And I wanted to show just, you know, start there and show that, and she's angry and and uh, she leaves and then we go to her when she's 11 years old and she's sitting on the steps of the old capitol building with her friend and uh and the, we start on a story there with her beloved friend cal and uh and cal and anna continue through the years as friends uh, with with distance and closeness throughout um, and at the end, as we know, they see each other after a long period of, of not seeing each other in the church where ultimately um, Anna goes. She leaves that 1909 celebration in, in the auditorium and she goes over to the church, St. Paul's, where the minister is talking about um, not being able to get in. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather, like rather be here at St. Paul's. And I found his sermon, and those are his words. Those are the that's what he said. He said, you know, I mean, isn't it ironic? And it was at the end that um in 1909, uh that the NAACP I was formed the year after. Um, the 1908 race riot in Springfield, Illinois. So that is one of those great steps forward yes. that occurred after some really brutal, ugly history. Yeah. Thank you, Nancy. So I have one final question for you. Yeah. Um, and that's what's next? What are you oh. working on now? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, at the moment, I have to confess, I don't have a project. Like you've earned a break. <laughs> uh, and I've learned not to talk about what I'm working about, <laughs> working on, you know. So so uh I have nothing to report either way. You know, well, that I'm is also fair. A grandmother recently, and that's that's kind of what I want to do. I'm it took me eight years to write this book. And uh so I'm taking a break. Well, and what what in eight years that has been for all of us, but this was such a timely book and a timeless book. And we appreciate you so much for joining us tonight and sharing more about your process and, and your creation. We really appreciate it, Nancy. Thank you. I was glad to be here with you. Thanks. Phyllis, back over to you. All right. Thank you, Nancy. Yes, it's it's been a wonderful evening and I've enjoyed all the exclusive insights on the, your latest book, The House of Lincoln. And I know everyone that is with us tonight has enjoyed it as well. Next up for our Four Score Speakers series, we welcome Dr. Ronald White on Tuesday, November 14th for a great discussion on his latest biography on Great Fields, The Life and Unlikely Heroism of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, due to be published by Penguin 
Penguin Random House on October 31st. For more information on how to register for our upcoming speaker, speaker series, please visit our website at lincolnpresidential.org. Finally, as you close out tonight's webinar, you will see a short survey. Please take a moment to complete the survey as it helps us to improve our offerings to you and lets us know what you would like to see in the future. As always, we thank each of you for joining us this evening. We look forward to seeing you all in November. Good night. Good night.